It is feared that the Prime Minister has drowned. A great search is being made for Mr. Holt off Potsy, Victoria. However, no official announcement has been made as to the fate of the Prime Minister. Mr. Holt went for a swim shortly after noon with a friend, Mr. Alan Stewart, a quarantine officer from the Melbourne suburb of Armadale. They swam out into heavy surf on the ocean side of the Mornington Peninsula. Mr. Stewart told the police he saw the Prime Minister dive, but he failed to resurface. JFK might have been shot, and Gaddafi might have been mercilessly killed by Libyan rebels, but has your nation's leader ever just vanished, never to be found again? The disappearance of Harold Holt has certainly sparked debate amongst conspiracy theorists. According to some, he was assassinated. According to others, he took his own life. And unfortunately, the truth is never quite as exciting, and Holt simply just proved to be a Chinese spy and was collected by a submarine. But what you might not realise was that Harold Holt was a really significant prime minister in his own right. He patiently waited as the heir to Menzies' throne, and in 1967, the Libs would still have five more years of power to go. And so, this video will not only look at the government that he ran, but also how the five years after his death shaped the course of Australian history. And so, if you missed it last time, I'd recommend watching this video we made on the Menzies government. We left last week with Holt rising to the top job in 1966, with Menzies finally retiring after a stint that spanned across three decades. Now, Harold Holt's brand, for lack of a better word, was to be the guy who was tough on communism as Menzies was, but was able to adapt to the social change of the 60s in a way that Menzies wasn't. Menzies was only 14 years older than Holt, but Holt made full use of the fact that they were born in different centuries. And so Holt came into office keen to continue Menzies' White Australia policy with some minor relaxations. Under Holt's leadership, non-Europeans could become eligible for migration on an individual basis if they had special skills or knowledge. This extension wasn't given to manual workers. You see, by the end, Menzies had only allowed Turks and Arabs to migrate because they were supposedly more sophisticated than East Asians. But Holt was much more supportive of East Asian migration and actually frequently visited the Asian capitals on tour. In fact, Gough Whitlam, the Prime Minister famous for opening the door to Asia, actually gave much credit to Holt for beginning the process. Now, elsewhere in social policy, Holt also put a referendum to the Australian people on removing two parts of the constitution for Indigenous Australians. The first was that the provision allowing the government to make special laws for Indigenous people be removed, and the second was the provision that didn't include Indigenous Australians in the population count. Australia overwhelmingly voted yes, and though this was symbolically really important, the main policy effect was that it allowed Western Australia and Queensland to keep its Senate allocation because of its now boosted population. Secondly, Holt opted to continue with Menzies' involvement in Vietnam. Now, over in America, JFK was killed back in 1963, and so Lyndon Johnson had taken over and increased America's intervention. By 1966, the anti-war movement was becoming much stronger, and Johnson looked to his allies. Unfortunately for him, under Harold Wilson, Britain made the call to reduce its commitment east of the Suez Canal and have a complete withdrawal from Asia by 1975. So Johnson's next best ally was Harold Holt. Fortunately for him, the two had a very strong relationship, and when pressed about Australia's involvement in the war, Holt famously assured that Australia would go all the way with LBJ. This friendship would also prove crucial in the 1966 election. Johnson visited Australia a month beforehand and gave a huge rallying cry against the supposed threat of Asian communism. The Libs ended up having their best election result since 1951. But in 1967, the relationship would become much less popular. The government was concerned about the contributing cost towards developing America's F-11 fleet, and Johnson persuaded Holt into contributing another battalion, fully well knowing that it would have minimal effect on the war. Planes would once again prove to be an issue for Holt as his government was tarnished by the VIP aircraft affair. Essentially, under the Menzies and Holt government, many of the key Liberal members were using military aircraft to take private flights. The bigger issue was that some in Holt's cabinet, including Holt himself, were accused of lying to Parliament about its misuse of planes. Ultimately, the Minister for Air, Peter Howson, confessed to parliamentary negligence, and Holt made a controversial call to keep him in his post. And when it came to managing the personnel within the coalition, Holt had more success when dealing with the country party leader, John McEwen. Essentially, unlike Britain with the pound, Holt made the call not to devalue the dollar. Now, had Australia devalued its currency, it would have been worth less in the foreign market, which really would have helped exports as our products would have been cheaper than other countries. 
McEwen was out of the country when Holt made this call and representing the rural areas who relied on exports, McEwen was furious. Holt's response was really simple though, back down or the coalition is over. It was kind of like threatening to break up with your girlfriend unless she withdrew her motion to watch the OC instead of Seinfeld. That's not going to be my only OC reference today either. I'm a man of fine taste. Buckle up. But McEwen eventually backed down and gave Holt a minor victory. At the back end of 1967, the Libs also seemed to be on the decline. Arthur Colwell had been in opposition for seven years, rallying against conscription, but he'd been replaced by the young and more exciting Gough Whitlam. In 1967, Labor won both by-elections in that year, and there were murmurs about replacing Holt. But really, that decision never had to be made, as Harold Holt went for that fateful swim at Cheviot Beach in Victoria. Now, Holt was known to not be the most faithful husband, and pardon the pun, but he wasn't a particularly healthy Harold by this point with a bad shoulder injury. So when Holt was with his neighbour Marjorie Gillespie and also with her daughters, he trotted out into the choppy southern Australian ocean, only to disappear without a trace. After about two weeks of searching without a result, the search was officially called off. So my subscriber question today is what happened to him? Wrong answers only. On December 22, 1967, a memorial service was held for the Prime Minister and some pretty high profile names were in attendance. Lyndon Johnson, Harold Holt and even Prince Charles. As that was happening though, the Libs were eyeing off each other, ready for Holt's coveted position. So in the weeks after Holt's death, it was really unknown as to who would be the new leader. In fact, at one point, it actually looked as if the interim Prime Minister, John McEwen, would go on to become the new boss. This would have been astonishing because remember, he was from the country party, the minority party within the coalition. However, the Libs wanted to stay internal and keep one of their guys as the leader, and so appointed a guy by the name of John Gorton to take over from Harold Holt. And with Gorton, I'm going to jump ahead to the end. You see, he actually went on to renounce his party membership and urged Australians to vote Labour in the 1975 election between Whitlam and Fraser. It would only be in 1999 that he was reluctantly accepted back into the party. So how on earth did he get to this point? Well, Gorton had a reputation as a blunt, true blue Aussie larrikin, but also as one that lacked any interest in, well, his job description, policy. In fact, when writing about his accomplishments after leaving office, one of his primary accomplishments that he spoke of was creating a quote, Australian identity and national feeling. Oh, dunno, a little word that I think's important in management called morale. By 1969, the Vietnam War was really unpopular, but it was really unknown where the Gorton government actually stood on the issue. Eventually in the same year, Gorton ended up announcing withdrawal from the war. Now, last week, we looked at the Labour-Left, Labour-Right split that occurred after Herbert Everett reached out to the Soviet Union to hear of their involvement in the Petrov affair in the 50s. Everett's faction viewed it as a fair move and they became Labour-Left. A guy called B.A. Santamaria viewed it as treachery to talk with the Communists and they became Labour-Right. Now, Santamaria actually left Labour to form the Democratic Labour Party. Typically, they gave their first preferences to the Liberal Party, but Gorton had put the DLP offside. Not only that, but Gorton also annoyed the states by keeping taxation powers in the hands of the federal government. He famously didn't get on with Liberal Premiers Bob Askin and Henry Bolt. So in 1968, Gorton wanted an early election, but his party actually wouldn't let him have it because they were worried that the DLP would preference the Labour Party. The election would wait until 1969, which the Libs did win, but lost 15 seats in the process. In 1971, Malcolm Fraser resigned as Defence Minister over what he described as Gorton micromanaging him. The pressure was now well and truly on Gordon. Allied backbenchers of Gorton's, Alan Jarman and Len Reid, called for a vote of confidence in Gorton's leadership and the ballot was split 33 votes each with one last casting vote. Gorton's. Astonishingly, Gorton deemed that a majority of the party did not have confidence in his leadership and so used the vote to cast against himself. With Gorton now gone, thanks to his own doing, William McMahon was in. You've already forgotten his name, haven't you? I put it in big text just five seconds ago and you still can't remember. Unfortunately, out of the non-interim Prime Ministers, William McMahon is perhaps the most forgettable. He's definitely in the same tier as someone like Chris Watson and what I suspect Malcolm Turnbull will end up being. Now, McMahon was only in for a year and a half, so there's not heaps to talk about in terms of policy, with one exception, his foreign policy towards China. 
So like I said before, Gotham was the opposition leader by this point, and Whitlam actually made secret overtures to China to try and build a good relationship with them as they started to distance themselves from the Soviets in Vietnam. Because Red Terror had worked so well in the 50s and the 60s, McMahon harshly criticised Whitlam for accepting an invitation to the Middle Kingdom. Unfortunately, this was the worst possible timing. In 1972, Richard Nixon made his famous visit to see Mao and reframed China as a key piece in the puzzle to actually beating the Soviet Union. McMahon looked like an idiot for being so outspoken on Whitlam's visit, and Whitlam looked like he knew what was up by making plans before Nixon's famous visit. So in preparation for the 1972 election, the Libs knew that they were a long shot. In a last ditch effort, McMahon offered income tax cuts, pension increases, and tried to get the states back on side by restoring states' rights over offshore minerals. It was one final pitch not to vote Labor. This was kind of like when Caleb Nickel bribed Marissa not to stay at Jimmy Cooper's in season one of the OC. Don't roll your eyes, you all knew that this was coming. But speaking of bribes, the Mr. Mitchell History podcast is now on Spotify. Link in the description, make sure to click follow. And by supporting us on Patreon for just $1.50, you'll have the chance to bribe us into doing podcast topics of your choice. Our first episode comes out in January, and Patreon support will ensure it'll be sustainable throughout the year. But in 1972, McMahon couldn't compete with Whitlam. Whitlam was offering serious tax reform, Medicare, ending uni tuition fees and conscription, and there was no question that the Liberal Party had just gotten stale. In 1972, Labor finally ended 23 years in the wilderness as Whitlam won 67 seats to 58. So was McMahon a failure? Well, I'd argue no. As soon as he came in, it was damage limitation, and to keep Labor to just 67 seats in 1972 was actually pretty impressive. Anything more, and Malcolm Fraser almost certainly wouldn't have gone on to become Prime Minister in the same decade. It was kind of like Kevin Rudd doing damage limitation in 2013. But Whitlam was in, and for the next two weeks, you're going to get the best two episodes of the entire series. So don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss it. Also, if you liked the video, hit that like button. YouTube uses that as a measure of if the video is worth being put out there or not. Also, thank you to all our generous patrons. If you're able to support us, every dollar really does help us. And you can do that by clicking the link in the description or in the pinned comment. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.